You face disaster deployments, understanding FLSA and the 29-day rule. So what is FLSA, exempt and non-exempt, and more importantly, why should I care? Well, first things first, let's talk about position classifications. The classification of a position's duties determines the overtime pay entitlement for the employee assigned to the position. Positions are classified as exempt or non-exempt from the Fair Labor Standards Act, or FLSA. Therefore, employees in their positions are either exempt or non-exempt from the FLSA. In most cases, non-exempt positions are those that are technical, specialized, clerical, and or non-supervisory. Ugh, this is already boring. I thought we were going to talk about deployment stuff. Yeah, we're getting there. So all USACE employees have an FLSA status tied to their official position of record. When deployed on an emergency response, each employee has a position description tied to an EngLink tasker. Although the EngLink position descriptions have an FLSA status, employees continue to retain the FLA status of their officially classified position of record. Okay, that's great, but again, why should I care? Because money. The bottom line is that the rules for payment of overtime and travel as hours of work differ according to an employee's FLSA status. Overtime pay for exempt GS employees is the higher of overtime rate of pay of a GS 10 Step 1 or the employee's hourly rate of pay. However, the overtime rate for a non-exempt employee is always one and a half times the employee's hourly rate of pay. So how does that affect disaster deployments? FLSA status is determined by the nature of duties performed by the employee, even on deployments, and FLSA status impacts pay. Therefore, it is imperative that deployed employees perform temporary work consistent with their official FLSA status. However, there are times when this is not possible, and this results in a mismatch. Wait, what's a mismatch? A mismatch is when exempt employees are deployed in a position that performs non-exempt work, and the less frequent occurrence of non-exempt employees deployed in positions that perform exempt work. So, I'm a non-exempt employee. I still don't understand why I should care. Well, when a non-exempt employee primarily performs exempt work for more than 30 calendar days, the employee must be considered exempt for the overtime pay. Instead of FLSA overtime pay, the pay will be recalculated retroactive to the beginning of the period of temporary work to determine if the employee is entitled to any Title V overtime pay. Wait, that means I actually get paid less if I deploy for more than 30 consecutive calendar days? Bingo! Bet you care now, huh? That means if you extend your deployment beyond 29 days, Uncle Sam will come knocking on your door and tell you that actually you owe the government money. Okay, got it. But what if I'm an exempt employee? Why should I care about this rule? Well, when an exempt employee primarily performs non-exempt work for more than 30 calendar days, the employee must be considered non-exempt for overtime pay. Instead of Title V overtime pay, the pay will be recalculated retroactive to the beginning of the period of temporary work to determine if the employee is entitled to any FLSA overtime pay. Which is just a fancy way to say that instead of receiving the higher of the overtime rate of pay of a GS-10 Step 1 or the employee's hourly rate of pay, the entire 30 days will be recalculated and the employee will receive one and a half times their hourly rate of pay. Hold up, that actually sounds awesome. That means I get paid way more, right? Well, yeah, technically that's what that means. But remember, during deployments, FEMA is footing the bill. They're paying for your labor and time during an emergency response, and they don't take too kindly to huge unexpected increases in their bills from USACE to cover these sorts of things. Fine, I get that. So, what's the fix? What do we need to do? Both exempt and non-exempt employees working duties that are not consistent with their home station FLSA status, mismatched employees, so to speak, may not exceed working 30 days at duties assigned to the other FLSA status. They must return home and remain home for a minimum of one full pay period before returning on a new tasker. Oh, is this that 29-day rule I've heard about? Yep. The 29-day rule is a USACE coin name established for emergency deployments for the time limit during which exempt employees may perform non-exempt duties. Exempt employees must be returned to the position of record on or before the 29th day to avoid the change of pay. Uh, this sounds like something we should know ahead of time and plan for. 
Yeah, you're right. As much as possible, exempt employees should be assigned to duties that match their permanent position of record to avoid the change of pay. Volunteers who want to deploy for emergency response and their home district emergency management offices should know both the FLSA status of the employee and the FLSA status of the responder position in which the volunteer is being placed. That way, we can make sure we avoid mismatches as much as possible and set and manage an employee's expectations of maximum deployment lengths in the hopefully rare cases where we do have a mismatch. But wait, I heard there was some kind of waiver process if I want to stay longer. Well, there is a waiver process, but it's not for every case, and it's not about whether you want to stay longer or not. It's more about who needs to stay longer. Let's go through some examples. This is Emma. Emma deployed to Puerto Rico a couple weeks ago. Emma is deployed in a position that doesn't match her FLSA status, since she is an exempt employee but filling a tasker for a non-exempt position. The supported district wants Emma to remain in her position beyond her initial 30-day tasker because Emma, specifically, is needed for continuity of efforts in what is turning out to be a complex response. So, can Emma stay on beyond her 30 days if the EOC extends her tasker? The answer is maybe, with appropriate prior coordination and approval. Per ES 11044, Section 7513, an extension beyond 30 days for an employee in a deployed position with an FLSA status that is not consistent with the employee's position of record must be approved in writing by both the supported district commander and a FEMA representative. The Emergency Support Function 3 management cell at the Joint Field Office would obtain FEMA approval, which is the most important part of this equation, since remember, FEMA is the agency that will be footing the bill. We need FEMA to agree or acknowledge ahead of time that they're okay with the fact that Emma's labor will now be at a higher cost before moving forward and extending her tasker. Again, this type of waiver should be used on a case-by-case -case basis and is not appropriate for every mismatched deployee situation. Okay, so if I'm a mismatched deployee and I'm not approved to be extended, do I have to go home for a full pay period before being deployed again? In most cases, yes, but the updated ES has introduced a new second waiver process for exemption under the 29-day rule under specific circumstances. Per ES 11044 paragraph 7512, the EOC or mission manager may request a waiver for a deployee to be exempt from the requirement to return home for a full pay period due to circumstances that could not have been anticipated. The waiver request must be formally submitted for approval and each waiver request will be handled on a case-by-case -case basis. If approved, the employee will be allowed to serve a shorter time period back at their PDS before then being eligible to return to an emergency mission. The more compelling the argument on why this particular employee is the one who needs to be back sooner than a full pay period, the better the chances that the waiver will be approved. Yeah, I'm still confused. Can you provide some more examples? Sure, this is John. John deployed about a month ago to Guam. He is deployed in a position that matches his FLSA status since he is non-exempt, filling a non-exempt tasker. The EOC would like to move him to an exempt position within the PRT at the end of his current tasker. So what do you think? Does John need to redeploy for a pay period before he transitions to the new exempt PRT role? Nope. Since John has been deployed in a position that matches the FLSA classification of his normal position, he does not need to redeploy home first to accept or be transitioned to the new tasker. Once that new tasker takes effect, however, the clock starts. Since John's FLSA classification is now different from the one of his new deployed position. Okay, but I want another example. Third time's the charm after all. No problem, this is Jane. Jane is a non-exempt employee that deployed about two weeks ago in an exempt PRT position, which of course doesn't match her FLSA status. The EOC would like to move Jane to another exempt position at the end of her current tasker. Is that okay, or does Jane need to return home for a full pay period because she is subject to the 29-day rule? Jane is in a mismatch position since she's non-exempt and was deployed in an exempt position. That means Jane will need to return home a full pay period before being able to deploy on a second mismatch tasker. Wait, but can the EOC submit a waiver, as mentioned in ES 11044 paragraph 7512, so that Jane doesn't have to go home and wait before she redeploys in a second mismatch tasker? Technically, yes. As described in ES 11044 paragraph 7512, the EOC can submit a waiver for approval on Jane's behalf. 
Again, each waiver request will be handled on a case-by-case -case basis. If approved, the employee will be allowed to serve a shorter time period back at their permanent duty station before then being eligible to return to an emergency mission in a mismatched tasker. Remember, the more compelling the argument on why this particular employee is the one who needs to be back sooner than a full pay period, the better the chances that the waiver will be approved. Jeez, that was a lot of information to say know your FLSA status and the status of the responder position you'll be filling. Yeah, it sure was, but it's really important and we hope you understand the issue a little better now. Thanks for watching all the way to the end.